streets are called by my name and seek my face and turn from the ways then will I hear from heaven then will I hear from heaven testing testing and will forgive and will forgive their sins and heal their Good morning, church. Those of you who are present here, it's lovely to see people in this building. Um, some of you have remember when we first started, it was just two people with a phone. Uh, thanks to Brandon and uh, Lisa and the others who have helped us um, get this message to those who are still not here physically with us, but it's so lovely to see faces uh, in God's temple here with us today. A um, couple of uh, announcements. Uh, we will be having board meeting this upcoming Thursday. Um, we also pray for our pastor who's in the middle of relocation process. We're excited that we have a pastor and he's going to be preaching again um, on the 15th if everything works out uh, for him. So let's keep our new pastor in our prayers uh, as well. Um, there's young adult uh, Sabbath school at 10 a.m. via Zoom and also Wednesday night prayer uh, via Zoom. If you want to join, uh, connect us, connect with us via our social media platforms and we'll send you uh, the link. Um, let's bow our heads uh, for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, the opportunity of uh, being here, of being able to worship you, um, to praise you, uh, to worship you, and to also lift each other up. I know there's been physical distancing, social distancing, but we are trying to remain spiritually together as a Scottsdale Thunderbird community, as your children as well. Uh, please uh, let your Holy Spirit manifest itself through us so that we can utilize uh, that power to remain connected with everyone and to also serve as a a beacon of hope for those who are struggling at this moment. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, for today's offering, it is going to be dedicated for uh, some of our universities, Oakwood, Andrews, and Loma Linda. So if you're following us online, just, just give a little shout out and let us know if you're from any of those universities. But uh, let me see for those, those few of us who are here, Anybody attended Oakwood University? Anybody, anybody? I've been there, lovely campus. Let's move it a little closer, California, Loma Linda. Do I say, ah, oh, yes, doctor, Loma Linda, great university. A lot of other degrees as well. I almost went there for my graduate degree in psychology, um, but went somewhere else. But what about Andrews University? Do I see some hands from Andrews University? Yes, that corner over there, that is also my alma mater. I went there uh, for beautiful years and for very cold winters. If you've been there, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, through our offerings, we're going to be supporting Adventist education, specifically uh, these colleges. They are trying to do their best to attend to our student needs. They need to do a lot of modifications uh, to their campus and also to their online curriculum. Uh, so hopefully you can um, help. For those who are here, we're going to use just um, uh, we're not going to be passing the offering basket, so just wait for the deacon to reach you. If you are online, we have AdventistGiving.com. So let's bow our heads uh, to pray for today's offering. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for uh, providing us a, a template, a, a blueprint uh, for education. There's, there's a tremendous need to raise our children, our young adults, uh, in all matters of knowledge, physically, but also spiritually. 
and our universities are going through um, some challenging times, as well as here, our academy, our elementary, we pray that you uh, can expand this offering so that we can continue utilizing education as a way to uh, prepare your children for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. for the lovely music. It's great to feel the airwaves with uh, beautiful music to, to praise God. Uh, before we get going with our sermon by Mark today, let's open your Bibles, open your phone up, uh, whatever your mode where you have your scripture is, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, and it says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Amen. Good morning. Am I on here? All right. How's everybody doing this fine Sabbath afternoon? Or I guess it's still morning, isn't it? It's not quite afternoon yet. All right. Th thumbs up, thumbs down, or eh. Oh, I see a lot of thumbs up. That's good. That's good. Well, first of all, I want to welcome uh, anyone who's a guest. I'm saying that because I know we have some guests here. Uh, we have some uh, family friends who came all the way from Fresno, California. Um, the Castillo family, so welcome. We're so glad you're here, and um, it's fun to be spending this week with you guys. So um, everyone else who's here, uh, good to see some actual faces rather than looking into a monitor of some sort. Um, organic relationships are always better in my personal opinion, so um, happy Sabbath to everyone. Um, how many people are getting kind of tired of wearing the masks? Yeah, I see a lot of hands up. Me too. Um, I, I don't know about you guys. I know gas prices haven't really gone up. They're, they're pretty stable. But uh, in my family, um, gas costs have gone up because I get to my destination only to realize that I forgot my mask. And I have to go. So I, for every mile I used to drive, I now drive two miles because of my forgetfulness. So um, it definitely has an effect on, uh, on our wallets there. Nope, nope, you're not. I'm glad I'm in good company, though. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, today, uh, as Nassim, actually, Nassim, just to back up a little bit, I noticed you're, you're walking like a champ. Uh, no cast, no nothing. You got both shoes on your feet. Good deal. Praise God for that. Uh, he read a Bible verse for us from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. And uh, if you want to go back to that, if you have your Bibles whether that be a phone or an actual Bible, either one. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, I'm just going to read that real quick again. There are verse 20 and 21, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you in Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him known who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, what does it really mean to be an ambassador, right? 
you've heard some of those. Oh, this, this person's an ambassador. You know, we, we hear the word ambassador, and immediately um, I get like this feeling of reverence or awe or respect, right? Because an ambassador is a representative of an entity, whether that be a person, a country, uh, an organization, a brand, right? I mean, Nike has probably several brand ambassadors, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? person that goes around and they represent their, they, they market and they sell. Basically, they're, they're, they're salesmen in, in, in some regards. A good ambassador needs to be a good salesman, right? Well, I have a little bit of experience personally in that, and I'm going to share a story here. But first, let's, uh, let's have another quick word of prayer so I can make sure that I'm on track and being a good amb- ambassador myself. Let's bow our heads one more time, please. Father, we thank you for this brand new day. We thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for the sunshine. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity to meet here in person in your home. And I just pray that you will guide and lead everything that I say this morning. Um, open our minds and soften our hearts so that your word will be implanted in us. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. An ambassador. When I was in college, I think I was about 20, 21 years old. I was recently married. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to make it rich. I, got, I was reading through the newspaper ads looking for some sort of a summer job, and I found what I thought was going to be my ticket to, to making a lot of money. Um, has anyone ever heard of Cutco knives? How many people have ever used a Cutco knife? Hey, they, they are good knives. They are really good knives. But I, I, I answered the ad, I called the number, and they said, sure, come in for an interview. I went in, I interviewed. And they said, you're the man for us. We want you to sell our knives. And uh, we went through all the paperwork, and they gave me the orientation. And I actually received, I don't know how they do it now, but back 25 years ago when I did this, they actually gave me a starter set of these Cutco knives. And I got to keep them. And I thought, man, this is great. The, the, the caveat to that was that I had to sell so many to be able to pay for it. Um, so I en- ended up selling enough to pay for those knives But unfortunately, it stopped there. Because after I pleaded and begged and presented to all my friends and family and convinced a few of them to buy one or two knives, I realized that I wasn't much of a salesman. I would go to people's homes and I would lay out the knives and I would talk about how great they were and and ask for them to, you know, get something for me to cut and I'd show them how sharp they were and I took the the scissors, and I cut through a penny. I mean, I did all the the bells and whistles that were supposed to sell these knives to anyone. But there was one problem. I was not personally invested in it. And I had a hard time selling that which I wasn't personally invested into. And so when they said, ah, man, they're kind of expensive, instead of saying, oh, no, but the quality, the this, the that, and instead of pushing and selling and, and not taking no for an answer, me being the uncommitted, naive, I guess nice person that I was, I would say, oh yeah, you know they are kind of expensive. You don't have to buy them if you don't want them. What kind of a salesman says that? So of course, you know, my parents felt sorry for me, so they bought a knife or two, and my grandparents and a few close friends. And uh, I got to keep the knives, and every time I pick one of those knives up, I remember what a poor salesman I am. Now, As a dean, I get the experience to work with a lot of young boys, and uh, it's interesting because I've had an opportunity to see some pretty crafty salesmanship take place within the walls of the boys' dorm. I had a young man, I won't mention names because I think a lot of us know this young man, who was a really good salesman. He was walking through campus the day after one of those big storms that, you know, knock branches off trees and whatnot. And he found this, this I, I would call it a large stick or a small branch. It was probably about four feet in length, about the diameter of my arm or maybe a little, little skinnier than that. And he took this branch and he thought, well, I'm going to take this branch and I'm going to take my pocket knife and I'm going to shave off all the bark. And I'm going to take it into the maintenance shed and I'm going to sand it down so it's shiny and polished, all good and smooth. And he got the thing looking real nice. And he had it in his room for a while, and every once in a while he'd get it out and carry it around the dorm, and people would admire his stick. 
and people would talk about all the work he put into his stick. And then one day, about a month later, I noticed another boy walking down the hall toward me with a big grin on his face like he had just won the lottery. And he was holding the stick. And I was like, what, what, what are you doing with so-and-so stick? He's like, oh, I just bought it from him. You bought a stick? He's like, yeah, I, you know, I just, I just, uh, he had it out and um, I asked how much you wanted for it. And he said, I don't know, how much do you want to pay for it? And I gave him 30 bucks for this stick. $30 for a stick. I don't know what that kid told him to get him to buy this thing for 30 bucks, but he could have gone out and got his own stick for free. There are good salesmen and there are poor salesmen. And unfortunately, I fall in the category of the poor salesman. However, I think whether you're good at sales or bad at sales, when you fall in love with Christ, you are invested. And whether you're good or bad at selling, if you are invested in something, you're going to be able to advertise that or represent that in a, at a much higher level than you would be able to if you were not invested. Amen? And I wouldn't call myself a salesman, but I do have the honor and the privilege to be able to stand up and share what I personally feel is the best investment that you can ever make in your entire life, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. How can we be an ambassador for God? How can we represent Him in a way that gives Him honor and then that draws others to Him? You guys want to, want to hear some, some tips on that? All right, so let's, let's get into this here. Um, I looked up what, what is an ambassador. Basically, we talked about it. It's just a, repre a representer or someone who um, basically stands to uh, advertise or represent something, right? So I looked up what it takes to be a good ambassador, and I, I came up with six points, and I kind of tweaked them to what I thought was more appropriate to our Christian faith. So we're going to go through these six points one at a time, we're going to pull some scriptures, some examples, and we're going to talk about this just a little bit. And hopefully today, when we leave here, we'll not only be motivated to be better salesmen for Christ, but we'll have a few little tools in our pocket to help us actually make it work. When the rubber meets the road, right? When we're out there on the streets or in the airplane or at the grocery store, we'll have some tools and some knowledge and some know-how on maybe how to use our skills better to serve him in that capacity. So, number one, number one of six, knowledge. I knew a little bit about those Cutco knives. I knew that their handles were made of thermo resin, which is the same material that, you know, they make bowling balls out of. It's dishwasher and microwave. No, I don't know if it's microwave safe. No, because it has metal in it, so take that back. Don't go home and put your Cutco knife in the microwave. It will not end well, Okay. Um, but it is dishwasher safe, okay? And the handles are this, this really cool word I thought when I was 20 years old. I never heard this word before. They're ergonomically correct, meaning that they are designed to fit the anatomical, um, you know, part of your body that it's used for. And that, in this case, the hand is er ergonomically designed to fit in your hand so when you're chopping the onions and the tomatoes, you don't have muscle fatigue in your hand or whatever, Okay? Um, I, I had some basic knowledge on those Cutco knives, okay, but I still wasn't able to sell it. But knowledge is important, okay? And every single one of these points that I'm going to make to you, you have to remember that the bottom foundation to making that work is being invested yourself, okay? So if you're invested, you need to gain knowledge. You need to gain an understanding of the product in which you're trying to sell. In our case, as Christians, we need to gain a knowledge of our Creator. We need to know Him. And when the Bible uses the word know, it is a much higher standard than we usually talk about here face to face, right? Oh, hey, this is Bob. Do you know Bob? Yeah, I know Bob. He's the, he's the other guy who forgets his mask, right? Um, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about algebra. I know a little bit about geometry or, or, you know, whatever. That's basic knowledge. But when the Bible uses the word know, it is 
the pinnacle of intimacy, right? Um, you take all the different kinds of love and you combine them together. You have, you know, agape love, storge, filii, all these different types of love. But that agape, unconditional love, that, that's, that, that's the kind of knowledge that we're talking about here, okay? Adam knew Eve and they had a child. They experienced an intimate relationship in that which only a husband and a wife can experience. And through that high standard of intimacy, good, good results came, right? Okay, they, they were able to um, multiply the earth or whatever their, their job was back then, right? Know him on an intimate level, okay? And how do we do that? Let's take a look real quick. I've got a Bible verse for you. If you want to open up to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. Proverbs 8, verse 17. Short little verse to help kind of just nail this into our long-term memory, hopefully. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Those who seek me diligently will find me. We have to pursue him, right? Now, the amazing thing about God is when we are pursuing him, he makes, he op, he op, he's already open. The door is already open, right? He come to me, all ye who are heavy and weary laden. All, you know, he, his door is open. We don't have to knock on his door. We just have to go. It's wide open already. But God being the gentleman, when he pursues us, you know, you, you, hear, the, you hear the knock. I don't have anything to knock up here. He knocks on our door because he's a gentleman. He doesn't force his way in. But when we take this verse... Okay, and we seek him diligently, we will find him because he is open to us already. But we have to want it. We have to not just want the knowledge, we have to be intimately invested in knowing him. And when we make that um, promise to ourselves and we put the effort into getting to know him, we will know him. Okay, so knowledge, the first and probably one of the most important parts is knowing what we're trying to sell. In this case, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Point number two, point number two, is presence. Not presence under the Christmas tree, but presence as in like we're all present here today, right? Okay? Being present, taking the opportunity that lies right before us. If we're at the grocery store and someone is short a nickel and you have a nickel, give them the nickel. That's an opportunity to witness for Christ, right? I've had people do that for me. I've done that for people, okay? Um, looking and being with it in whatever environment you're at, whether it be at work, at the store, driving down the road, if we are aware of our surrounding, we will be amazed at the many opportunities we have to witness for Christ, okay? So we have to have an, an awareness and a with itness on what is happening around us. So presence. So first is knowledge. Second is presence. So with this presence, let's look at another Bible verse here real quick. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Ephesians, Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15, it says, Be very careful, then, how you live, not as the unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. One of the things that I'm preaching to myself here as well as you guys that I hope I leave here with a better understanding is the importance of asking God to open doors of opportunity so that we can be his ambassadors. Amen? Share a quick story with you. Why, why does every preacher have a story about being on an airplane? I don't know. But I was on an airplane flying from... Kansas City to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I was going to a physical education convention. And I was going to be there for a few days. And uh, I get on the airplane, I find my seat, I sit down, there's no one sitting around me. I'm sitting, I think I was in the window seat. And people start to trickle in after me. And you know you're trying not to make it too obvious, but you're you're sizing up every person that walks in the airplane thinking, I hope that person either does or doesn't choose to sit by me. I can't remember what 
airline I was on, but it was one of those where you got to choose your seat. I don't know, what, what airline would that be? Do you even know? Southwest. I think it was Southwest, actually. Thank you. We have an expert in the field here. So I, was, I must have been on a Southwest airplane. And, you know, the, the, the six, seven guy with shoulders like three feet wide comes walking down the aisle, and I'm thinking, oh, please don't sit by me. I'll be scrunched up against the window, right? few people come by, and there was a woman who got on the plane. She was about the age of my mom, and she was a slender build. She was attractive, and she looked friendly. And her eyes were searching for the same reason my eyes were watching everybody coming in, thinking, who do I want to sit by? And for some reason, our eyes met, and we both smiled, and she sat down next to me. And I thought, phew, I got a good one. And we sat there, and uh, I don't know how long the flight was, but we talked from the time she sat down until the time we walked off the plane together. And we had so much in common, it was crazy. She, her son was my age, and uh, many of you who know me, I like to run. I ran in high school. I ran in middle school, college, high school, everywhere in between. I still run today. And uh, her son also ran for a university. I can't remember which one. This, it's been a few years back. And uh, we got to talking. We had so much in common. Her brother had once held the American record for the half marathon. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool. And we just talked. And her son was also a teacher, like I was. He was also wanting to start a cross-country team at the small school that he taught in. He was also wanting to design a cross-country course through the forest that was by his school, like I was literally doing at that moment for our school. And it was just so crazy that all, we had all these similar things in common. We shared a little bit about our faith. I think I left a good presence of my, perspect, my perspective of who God was for her, and she left a good impression on me as well. Interesting thing, after my convention was over, three, four days later, I got on an airplane, and lo and behold, guess who else got on that plane? It was the same lady and we sat together again and talked and reminisced. And I told her I was going to be running a four-mile race that very next weekend. And she said, no kidding. My son's going to run that exact same race. We, I ran the race, and I thought, well, maybe I'll see you there, you know. I got done with the race. I never did see her, but I was looking through the results. I placed 10th. Her son placed ninth. He was one second in front of me. We literally ran almost side by side for four miles, not knowing who the other person was. I emailed her and told her, and, and we just got a good laugh out of that. But when we are aware of our surroundings, and we are purposeful about taking the opportunity to get to knowing another person, I believe that that is one way we can be a disciple of Christ and be a good ambassador for him. Amen? Now, I didn't preach the gospel to her, but she knew I was a Christian. She knew I worked at a Christian school. She asked a few questions. And I believe when the time of trouble comes and those of us who are Bible-believing Christians and keep the commandments and, you know, the forces that be might seek to do harm to those who are faithful to the gospel message and all of his commandments and all that kind of stuff, I think that some of these people are going to look back and remember that one good experience they had with that person that might be persecuted and be like, hmm, these people aren't so bad as the media says they are, the news says that they are, whatever. Any opportunity we have to put a good taste in someone's mouth in reference to our faith, we should take that opportunity. Okay, so two is presence, being aware, being with it, and taking the opportunity. Okay, so knowledge, presence. The third one is professionalism. Okay, professionalism. Now, if you're a Christian, and you, I, honestly, I'm just going to say this straight out. If you're a Christian, by default, you are an ambassador for God. You, may be, you might be a bad example, I hope not. But hopefully you're a good example. But you don't have to have a degree. When I say professional, it's not like, oh, you have to have your master's degree in theology or you have to be ordained or anything like that. I believe that as soon as you accept Christ, I think you are ordained by God to be one of his representatives. Amen? Now, I'm going to say this. 
professionalism is a key import, important factor here. Um, and I'm going to share a quick story with you from my personal experience of how um, I got a bad taste of this when I was a child. Now, I grew up in a different church, and the, the priest of my church um, was, in my eyes, an ambassador for God. Now, I had an uncle who was, actually, he was my aunt's brother-in-law. So he wasn't, he was kind of one of those outskirt relatives, you know what I mean, not real close. I didn't see him a whole lot, but when we had big fav family gatherings, he would come. He was a priest, and my experience every time I was around him was negative. I was a little guy. But I can remember retreating to my room, wondering in my mind, who is God if this is his representative? Because every time I saw him, he was red in the neck and the face because he was drunk. And, I mean, I was probably eight or nine years old, but I heard dirty jokes on the playground, and they were nothing in comparison to some of the dirty jokes that my removed uncle, or whatever you want to call him, told at these family reunions. I was appalled. I was not impressed. And I do believe that that was a negative seed that came to fruition when I was in college that caused me to slip into what I call outward atheism and inward agnostic, agnostic. is agnosticism a word? <laughs> Man, I made up a new word. He's giving me the thumbs up. But I questioned whether there was a God inwardly, and outwardly I was so frustrated that I called myself an atheist. I think I called myself an atheist out loud in hopes someone, that someone would give me a reason not to be. You know what I mean? It was my cry for understanding, my cry for knowledge. But professionalism. Was it professional for this man who was an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be drunk as a skunk and telling dirty jokes, not just telling dirty jokes, but in the presence of children? Is that a good representation of Jesus Christ? You're thinking. That's not a good representation of Jesus Christ, right? We don't want to be that kind of ambassador. We have to have some level of professionalism when we talk to people, when we do the things that we do, whether you're a dentist or a realtor or a pastor or a teacher or a clerk at the store, if someone knows you have the title Christian, they're going to be watching. And like the old saying goes, you might be the only Bible someone ever reads. So have that high standard of Christian professionalism in whatever you do. Amen? Knowledge, presence, professionalism. Number four, leadership skills. Leadership skills. Um, I just realized I didn't read the Bible verse for professionalism. Let's go back real quick. Stop, rewind. Professionalism. Uh, let's look at 2 Corinthians, the, the book that we're in, and uh, let's bump ahead to chapter 6, and let's just pull out verse 14 here. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? The reason I pulled that text out for this particular thing is we don't want to be hypocrites, right? I know people who, who might represent Nike, and they go to the stores, and they, they wear all Nike, and they get the shoes out, and they say, these are our new brand of shoes, and they're trying to sell their shoe to a, a store or something like that. And then they go home, and they put their Adidas clothes on, or their Brooks clothes, or their Asics, or whatever brand of shoe is out there. They're a hypocrite, right? They're unequally yoked. They work for this guy, but on the side, they're, they're, they're tapping into this other system, right? Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a Christian hypocrite. It's all or nothing, baby, right? We got to jump in head first. We have to be fully committed and surrender all so that he can fill us to overflowing, right? So, a little of a reminder there. 2 Corinthians 6.14. All right, now, leadership skills. 
You know, there are some people who are just natural born leaders. They just kind of are, right? But not all of them are good leaders. I've, 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 I've realized I'm getting old. I've taught for 20 years, okay? Elementary, middle school, high school. I've taught for 20 years. I even coached at the college level for a short time. So I've worked with young people for over 20 years, including my education. I had a few extra years in there too with, with exposure to young people. I've seen a lot of good leaders. Okay, the power of influence is, is amazing. I've seen a lot of good leaders take people and do amazing things and accomplish great works. I've seen a lot of good leaders with bad characters that led people astray and down paths that leave them in utter destruction. We need to be good leaders. Amen? We need to lead not only by word, but by example. What our hands find to do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do, do to the glory of God, right? Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't lie. Upholding the, the, the God's moral law in everything that we do is key. It's critical. Okay? Being a good leader. Okay? Sometimes leaders are quiet people. Sometimes they're outspoken. Sometimes they take charge. Sometimes they sit back and observe a little bit until they formulate a plan, and then they step in and they present and they move people in great ways. You think of some of the great leaders in history? Genghis Khan, right? Adolf Hitler, great leader, horrible morals. Okay? Now, when I say great leader, you, you do understand um, the great is an adjective describing the leadership. They, they did big things, whether that be good or bad. Jesus Christ, great leader. Martin Luther King Jr., great leader. You've got to choose what kind of leader you're going to be. And it's amazing. People who think, I don't have any leadership skills. You can train yourself to be a good leader. You say, oh, a good leader is born. Yeah, good leaders are born, but great leaders are made. Amen? And I'll tell you what can make a great leader is spending time in the instructional manual called the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth, right? We've heard that numerous times. If we read the manual on how to be a good leader by following the best leader that the universe has ever seen, Jesus Christ, he can make the, the worst natural leaders into some of the most amazing leaders in the world. For instance, foul-mouthed sailors, cheating, dirty, rotten tax collectors. And he can turn them into some of the most amazing, prolific leaders that the earth has ever seen. And it can be you and it can be me if we just allow him to do that. And we, we get to put our effort in there too. Okay, so leadership skills. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of those attributes parallel with what we read in Philippians 4, 8. You know, talking about, you know, wherever you put before you to think on these things with good and lovely and of good report and pure and holy what goes in, what comes out, right? If we're filling ourselves with garbage, our output is going to be garbage. It's going to be subpar. It's not going to be what it could be, okay? So, being a good leader, doesn't matter if you're old, like the text says. Okay, some of the most amazing leaders I've known are young people, even children, don't let age be a stumbling block. God used young people to raise this thing that we call the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Advent movement was predominantly started with young people, right? You guys have heard this before, I hope. So, being a good leader is absolutely vital. Knowledge, presence, professionalism, leadership skills. The next one, we already tapped into a little bit. We're going to draw it out a little bit more specifically here. Passion for relationships. Passion for relationships. Let's look at John 13, 35 here real quick. John 13, 35. It says, By this 
all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. How can you see a disciple through their actions, their interactions with other people? That is one of the, the, the easiest way to tell if someone is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, if we dig deep enough, we could, I could have a whole other side sermon on this, but I think the book, The Desire of Ages, talks about this great, about knowing whether or not a person is a disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't necessarily mean that they go to church. It doesn't necessarily mean that they even call themselves a Christian. Believe it or not, it doesn't even necessarily mean that they've ever even heard from human lips the name Jesus. I didn't even put this in my notes. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to spew this out for you. Check my reference. If, you, if anybody has the Desire of Ages on page 538, and the only reason I know that page number is because this is one of my favorite little paragraphs in there. I'm not going to be able to spit it out word for word, but the general message in this, this paragraph on page 538 of the Desire of Ages is this. There will be people in the kingdom of God who, being moved by the Holy Spirit in the things that they see through nature, will be called the sons of God, and they will be in the kingdom one day. Isn't that amazing? When I was questioning and when I was thinking, wow, you know, is Christianity real? Is Jesus who he really said he was? Were we created by God? All these questions. I had some questions. What, what about that deserted island off there somewhere where no one ever heard the gospel? Is that fair that they're going to, what I used to think, burn in hell forever for eternity? Because they never even had it. That doesn't sound fair. This person never had an opportunity to hear the gospel and they're going to go to hell and burn forever? We know that as we read the Bible, that's not true. Okay, first of all, there is no eternal hellfire. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll t if you have questions on that, come see me afterwards and we'll point you in the right direction on that. But that's very clear from, from the scriptures. Secondly, God is a good judge. Amen? God is a good judge, and he is such a good judge that he doesn't have to look just at the outward evidence because he can look in the heart and in the mind, and he knows not only the actions, but the motive behind those actions. Amen? There are a lot of people who have some outwardly amazing works, but their motive is corrupt and evil. And we're going to wonder when we're in heaven, why isn't that person here? And God's going to say, like the scripture says, because I never knew him or her, right? And then there's going to be some other people who we've seen make some pretty serious mistakes. We've seen them fall flat on their face many a time, and we judged them. And we're going to say, God, I think you made a mistake on this one. And he's going to say, no. Nah. And he's going to open the books, and he's going to say, this is what you didn't understand. I could read his heart. The struggle was real, and so was the intent. Passion for relationships. That's what God's original design was created for, right? Relationships. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity itself. God says, I am love. You can't be love if you're just one. You have to have more than one. Love flows out. And if it flows out and there's nothing there to receive it, because love is what it is, it's going to create more things to receive and experience that love and to reciprocate that love because love is an action. Love is an interaction. Passion for relationships. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love people. Love people. Knowledge, presence, professionalism, leadership skills, passion for relationships. Number six, the last point I want to draw out today is this. Know your client. Okay? Know your clientele. 
Now, we don't, we're, we're not God. We can't read the heart. But we can have some, what I like to call, uncommon sense. Amen? Because it ain't so common anymore, is it? We used to call it common sense back in the day. Now I call it uncommon sense because it doesn't seem like anyone else has it. Amen? That's just me. Um, so know your clientele. Use some common sense when you're interacting with other people, when you're witnessing to people, when you're thinking, when is the time to slip in a little Christianity? Use common sense. Be a good discerner of your clientele. Okay? Um, and diver- we live in a diverse world, and diversity requires different approaches. Amen? You can't meet everyone at the same place. You've got to meet them where, where they're at. Okay? They might not be on the same plane you are. You might not be on the same plane they are, but you need to be able to be a discerner of that. I want to read uh, Romans 14. Let's go back to Romans 14, and uh, I would suggest reading the whole chapter. Uh, a lot of great stuff in there. But uh, we're going to uh, start at verse 12 and then skip down a little bit um, just for time's sake. Romans 14, we'll start at verse 12. It says, So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause of fall in our brother's way. How many times do we have good intentions, and because we're so bullheaded and stubborn and self-sufficient and egocentric and narcissistic that our good intentions turn into a stumbling block for someone else because they're not on the same page we are. They don't read the verse the same way we do. Their cultural background is different in such a way that when ours meets theirs, we may have the same Bible text, the same principle, the same teaching, but we view it from a different way and therefore there are some outward differences in an internal principle. I believe that God allows for that. Okay? Does that make sense? You go to some places in the world and people look at you sideways if you don't wear a tie. You ever been to Hawaii? Okay? They wear like those Hawaiian shirts, even the preachers sometimes, right? You ever go to a country where it's, it's shameful to maybe wear shoes in the synagogue or, you know, whatever the case might be? Cultural differences. We need to be able to blend when it comes to culture, but stand firm when it comes to principle. Amen? I think that is one of the major issues that um, we're dealing with in the world nowadays. And uh, sometimes on a pretty high plane with all the, the racial tension and different things like that. Sometimes we just have a hard time tapping into other people's cultures and understanding where they come from, who they are, why they do things the way they do. And uh, instead of not bending to meet them, we just stand firm and say, well, you're wrong, I'm right. God just hangs his head in, in shame, I think, when that happens. Okay, diversity requires different approaches. So we don't want to be a stumbling block. Let's look down here a little bit further. Uh, Romans 14, let's go to verse 21. It says, uh, Romans 14, 21, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink, I'm, I'm sorry, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. I think one of the strengths of Paul, one of the reasons why Paul was such an effective and powerful preacher, is he was malleable, he was pliable. He was able to conform to whatever situation he was in, okay? He knew his clientele. Do you guys remember the story when he walked in? I can't remember what, what city it was. And they, they, everything was lined up with statues. They had a God for this. They had a God for that. They had a God here and a God there. And each God had a specific purses, uh, purpose. And then there was one monument or statue or whatever it was, and it said, this is to the unknown God. 
I know a lot of people who would have walked in and just kicked dirt and said, this is, this is blasphemy and you know, condemned everyone and, and wasted a potential opportunity to witness for Christ. But not Paul. Not Paul. He knew his clientele and he was wise and discerning and he knew how to, to work within the context of his environment. And so Paul walked in there and he said, you know what? This unknown God, I know who that God is. Let me present to you what this God's all about. And he opened up the gospel of Jesus Christ. He took an opportunity based on the environment that we, he was in and, and based on the clientele. If you look at the four different gospels, they're written to vastly different audiences, right? Okay, was it, is, I think it's John that it, it's uh, kind of a removed um, it, it, it doesn't talk about touch, you know. A lot of times Jesus touched the lepers. He, he put the mud in the eyes. He, he, he did things physically, okay. But in the book of John, it talks more about he spoke and it came to be because the specific audience that John was writing to had a hard time with Jesus the man also being Jesus God. So John's purpose was to paint a better picture of Jesus Yes, he was man, but he really pulled out the fact that Jesus was also God. He spoke things and they came to be. Whereas some of the other Gospels were more focused on his, his manhood, right? He touched, he walked, he talked, he ate, okay? Different audience, different presentation, same God. Being pliable with the truth when it comes to culture, differences of opinion, different stances, different perspectives, yet standing firm in principle, Amen? I'm going to share a quick little story here. Um, I'm not sharing the story to cause controversy or strife or whether you agree or disagree. It's just a story. But I want us to think. I want us to think a little bit. There's a little dialogue. Okay? This is a fictitious little thing I just came up with. I thought it would be a good example. Um, little, little boy and his granddad. Okay? His grandpa. So a little boy says... Grandpa, this is a Sabbath, Sabbath day. He says, Grandpa, can we go to the store today? Grandpa says, Son, it's Sabbath. This is God's holy day. He wants us to rest and avoid work. He also doesn't want us to empty of, uh, employ others to work for us. Oh, sorry, Grandpa, I forgot. Can we go tomorrow? The conversation kind of dies out. A few hours later, a little boy walks up to the grandpa after church. I said, Grandpa, where, where did you get that drink? A friend bought it for me. Grandpa, but it's Sabbath. You said we can't go to the store because we don't want to have people work for us. Well, son, my friend doesn't understand this text the same way I do. Out of love for God, I don't go to the store, but out of love for my friend, I took the drink. I could explain to him that I don't want it, but he got it for me because he loves me. It was a thoughtful gift. It, was, it wasn't really the appropriate time to tell him about my conviction about going to the store on the Sabbath. But Grandpa, now you're sinning because you took the drink that he bought on God's holy day of rest. Son, love triumphs over all things. It's an uncomfortable situation, and I could have explained my position, but I know my friend sees it a little bit differently. It would only cause an argument. Whether I'm too strict or whether he's too carefree is less important than loving him. When the time permits, yeah, we can have that conversation and I can tell him how I see this situation. But for now, I'll love him by accepting his gift and I'll love God by living out my convictions and his understanding of his word. That makes sense, Grandpa. But why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow out of love for Kim, King Nebuchadnezzar. That's different, my son. The drink my friend gave me was on a, different, on a difference in opinion and understanding. His gift was motivated by love. King Nebuchadnezzar's command was indifference to God, and it was motivated by pride, selfishness, and greed. Thanks, Grandpa. I think I understand now. Now, you might be thinking in your mind whether that's right or wrong. That's up to you. But I hope that can at least help us to appreciate 
the diversity among God's people. When we have some people who are going to be in the kingdom of heaven and for the first time in the new Jerusalem, walking on the streets of gold next to the tree of life, plucking a ripe piece of fruit from the very tree of life, Jesus Christ himself in the flesh is going to walk up to them and they're going to look at Jesus, they're going to look at his hands, they're going to look at his feet, they're going to look at his side, and they're going to say, who are you and what happened? And then you're going to have other people in the kingdom of heaven, like the Martin Luthers, right? The, the King Nebuchadnezzar himself, who wrote a chapter of the book of Daniel, we believe is, is eventually was saved because God's persistence in working out things in his life, right? There are going to be people in heaven who were theologians with multiple doctorates over and over and over and could memorize the entire scriptures, and there are going to be those who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ by human lips. But God wants to work his plan of salvation through all of them. Now I want to go back. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21 again. And uh, actually I'm going to back up and we're going to start at verse 17 for a closing thought here. 2 Corinthians 5, starting verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God himself. Those six points, one more time, just to drive it home. Knowledge. Get to know God. I mean, really get to know him. Spend time in his word. Spend time on your knees. Spend time gazing at the stars in heaven and pondering the creator of the vast universe. Number two, take opportunities of the present situation, your environment, those people around you, the situations you find yourself in. Take advantage of those things. Number three, professionalism. Have a high standard for yourself and live up to it the best you can. And if you fall, and you surely will, reach up for that mighty hand of God and he'll pull you up like any, any good coach. He'll dust you off, give you a smack on the behind and say, get back in there, champ. And he'll set you, on, he'll set you right. Amen? Be a good leader. Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Lead. Lead by word and lead by example. Have a passion for relationships. If you don't remember anything else, remember, love one another. And know your clientele. I didn't mean this is going to change the, the story, but I have to share this with you. This is, this is kind of amusing. There was a vacuum cleaner salesman. He walked into his, uh, you know, uh, he going door to door. He, he went up and knocked on this house. Brand new house. The person living there had just moved in. Fresh, beautiful, clean carpet. The kind of carpet that you, you, you don't even ask. You just take your shoes off because it looks so good. You know what I mean? And he walks in with his vacuum and a bag of dirt. And the lady is a little apprehensive, oh, you know, but she was nice. She let him do his presentation. And he's doing this presentation. He takes his bag of dirt and dumps it on a brand new carpet. She's like, oh, what'd you just do? He said, don't worry. This vacuum is so good. If, I, if there was one crumb of dirt left on your carpet when I'm done, I'll lick it up with my own tongue. And she said, do you want some ketchup with that? The electricity isn't hooked up yet. 
Know your clientele, okay? Know your clientele. Let's bring it back into focus here. God is good, amen? God wants to use you. God wants to use me. And if we do our part in getting to know him, taking advantage of our gifts and the opportunities that surround us, the kingdom's going to be full. And your name's going to be responsible for a couple of those people in there, maybe. Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity of life. We thank you for the opportunity of choice. And it is my sincere prayer that today, each and every one present will choose to live for you. Lord, we ask that you would open up opportunities for us. We pray that you will help us to apply some of these principles that we've drawn from your word so that we can be good representatives of you, um, good, effective, and quality ambassadors of the God of heaven, and uh, that we can share the gospel with those around us, whether through word or through actions, but uh, most importantly, the foundation of everything that we do uh, would be rooted in love, in love for man and love for you. We ask this in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, and all the people said, Amen.